G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. We'll have all the show notes and any resources mentioned in the cast on our website. After 20 years in the wine industry, in 2010, age 41, Darren decided to go out on his own. Initially on selling casks, coopered overseas solely to the wine industry here in Australia. A cooperage manufactures the wooden casks or barrels wine or spirit is aged in. A 3,000 plus year craft, it is still a very manual process these days. Starting with one FTE, his mum soon joined him to help with the admin and now his three businesses have a team of around 30, with just over 20 of those coopers. In 2000, in 2014, he formed the Tasmania Cars Company and a few years later acquired a customer and competitor in South Australia, now named Australian Coopers. Funding came from the three Fs, friends, families and fools, until an investor bought in in 2015. This investment helped propel sales from 80 cars in 2012 to more than 20,000 in FY19, with 90% of those sold in now in the spirits industry, not wine. Excellent communication, a kick-ass team, and investment in R&D and innovation are at the heart of managing the three businesses' success. Excellent communication, a kick-ass team and investment in R&D and innovation are at the heart of managing the three businesses' success. Darren believes the hardest thing in growing a small business is cash flow on people. And advice he'd give himself on day one is not to be hard on yourself. Take the time to celebrate the wins and with the people around you. Remember, when starting out, the bigger the opportunity, the harder it will be. Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm interviewing Darren Lange from Master Cask, Tasmania Cask Company and Australian Coopers. G'day, Darren. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, Troy, how are you? Yeah, very good. Good. Let's start off with this uh, brain scratcher. Do you recall how we met each other? I do. I do remember sitting in a meeting at the Lark Distillery. Yeah, that's right. My guess would be, in terms of timing, mid-2015, maybe? That's right. Yeah, I reckon yeah, it was... Yeah. I finished up there in August, so I reckon it might have been July or around then, yeah, that we, we met and we just seemed to hit it off. We did. Uh, talk, talking business and uh, obviously in the same industry at the time. So, yeah, that's uh, five, nearly five years ago now. Mm. I think uh, it was around that and I think I think there was a pretty common theme to the discussion um, around the challenges of what, what is a very new uh, industry at the time and some of our, some of our frustrations, some of our challenges. And I think, I think that's been a common theme. Uh, with some of other some of your other guests that you've had, like David uh, from Starwood, so yeah, absolutely. And that timing actually is good for context for the audience that aren't in whiskey. So to, mid two thousand and fifteen was just over a year after Sullivan's Cove here in Tasmania won the best single malt whiskey in the world, which is a huge, huge accolade, and the first whiskey in the Southern Hemisphere to do so, and only the second outside of Japan, Scotland, or Ireland to win the big award. Kavalan mm. won it the year before. So we, when we had that conversation when we first met, obviously frustration of you know a lot of growth, but it was also just spectacular growth for the Australian whiskey industry, particularly Tasmania at the time, uh, a year after Sullivan's winning that award. That award, yeah. Oh, it's certainly it's, it's you know I, I think back. I don't think a lot's changed in terms of the the excitement and the opportunity that exists in the in the broader spirits industry in Australia. Um, obviously, back then it was largely single malt focused, but um, you know, it's a great industry to be a part of and there's lots of opportunities and that's been consistent, you know, since since that award, I think, in 2014. So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, a, yeah. it's a fun industry to be in and dangerous sometimes at two in the morning, somewhere in a bar somewhere in the world. With uh, Well, yeah, certainly what I found, you know, not in transitioning from the wine industry to the spirits, but becoming involved in the spirits industry, having uh, worked for 20-odd years in the in the wine industry before that was... Just the difference in tasting uh, thirteen and a half percent alcohol wines to tasting, you know, up to sixty three and a half percent spirits was in the was, morning was, cha- was challenging in the At morning. eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> that did definitely it definitely took some getting used to. That's yes, for sure. <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> well, let's tell the audience a bit about your business. You've got a, a diverse business in the sense you've got three now. So maybe go back to the start and talk run us through. Um, the name located, what it does, how it makes money, and the transition to what you now have those three companies in the group. Yeah, sure. I uh, pro- well, I might go back just prior to even starting my own business. I had uh, thirty odd years in the wine industry, and and twenty of those sort of specialising in uh, representing uh, 
coopers from around the world. So, uh, and and at in my early days, actually, with one of the largest producers of French oak barrels for the for the wine industry. So, a long background um, that led to an opportunity in two thousand and ten. Um, to start my own business. So uh, at that point, it was completely focused on, on representing wine cars. So what I'd been doing for the, for the last 20 years. Um, and the idea there was to, I, I saw an opportunity uh, to bring a portfolio of Coopers together. So rather than just represent one Cooperage and have, or be a one trick pony in terms of what you can offer a winemaker is have a diverse portfolio where, where you can add a lot more value to the relationship with the winemaker. Um, and I'd been doing that in previous businesses, but this was an opportunity to tie um, some really high-end specialist cooperages together in one portfolio. And so that was the, I guess that was the starting point. Um, I felt like having built a reputation in the industry, uh, having good relationships in the industry, that there was an opportunity to bring something of higher value yeah. um, into the wine industry. So that was the starting point. Um, I guess for the audience to understand that aren't again aren't in our industry of uh, spirits, a cooper maybe explain a bit about what uh, you know a, a cooperage does just briefly. Well, a cooperage, um, you know, the term just may you know is actually fabrication of, of of barrels for the for the for the industry. Now that that's a three thousand plus year old. Um, um, uh, craft yeah that hasn't yeah. hasn't changed a lot in in that in that time so the fundamentals of making a barrel haven't changed a lot there's a little bit of automation but there's some parts of the process that you just can't automate so. yeah i was surprised when i got into the industry years ago just ha- still how manual it is to to and for the audience so it's taking wood often it's american or french oak from a tree obviously and then uh, creating staves which are the kind of got, got a, a bit of a what do you call it? The um, a bilge, a bend. Yes, a bend. Yeah, if you like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then a couple of metal hoops around it to make the casks that would traditionally hold wine for maturation or uh, rum or whiskey, other aged spirits. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you go right back, uh, you know the the craft actually was born out of the boat building, um, you know, uh, wooden boat building sort of times where they knew how to bend uh, timber to make boats. You know, prior to that, uh, really, what you were doing was um, the conversion was actually out of um, earthenware, so you know terracotta and um, right. ceramics and other sort of containers that used to transport goods around on ships. Um, and as I said, as they were building ships to transport things around the world, um, uh, the barrel was was sort of born out of that as a, as a transport vessel more than anything. And it was really by by accident, as most most inventions are, that they realised that certain you know wines and <laughs> You know, spirits and those you know liquids that were put into barrel for transport actually benefited from that time in the cask and that's where maturation was sort of born out of yeah i heard a story i haven't looked it up whether it's folklore or not but in uh, the scottish weren't very fond of the english at the time in particular and the, the english were going around taxing a lot and taxing alcohol so they were hiding the what we call whiskey in um away from the tax man so they'd hide them in um, ex you know old wine casks and old um, oak casks that so the taxman couldn't find it and after a while they realized that the effect of the wood on the spirit because whiskey it's my understanding whiskey that what we call today used to be the clear spirit like vodka um wasn't really aged and it wasn't until they were trying to hide it from the taxman they're putting it in these casks tucking it away in churches etc so they couldn't get found and taxed then they realized actually this tastes better than just the the, the clear stuff that comes off the still is, it, is that your recollection yeah and there's there's probably stories like that all around the world you know madeira um you know they they put madeira on on boats for transport um you know some of those boats would get into trouble at sea and have to return to to port and they'd spent time away you know in rough seas with the with the liquid moving around in the barrel and interacting with the oak and uh, and the, and when the when the ships returned and they still had the same barrels on board with the same liquid in them, found them to be significantly better. Yep. Um, so that that sort of developed the style for producing Madeira. Likewise with bourbon in the US, you know, similar sorts of stories of, of moving moving spirit around the country and, um, you know, customers 
in the early days, perhaps um, responding to the supplier, suggesting it was faulty because it had changed colour. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. yep. And then subsequently realised that it actually tastes better and, you know, similar sorts of stories from all around the world. So, yeah. yeah. And again, finally, I guess for context for the audience, uh, your what, the, what you offer, the product that you provide to distilleries around Australia is obviously for aged spirits, so mainly rum, whiskey, uh, brandy. It's got to be aged in cast for at least two years to be called legally whiskey in Australia, three years if it's in UK or EU. But yeah. what I've really found striking when I got in the industry was that 60 to 70% of the flavour and effectively the quality, I guess, comes from the oak from that time spending in the cask yeah look it's um that number gets thrown around a lot and it, yeah. and it varies a little bit um i think it i think it's a number that probably from my point of view relates more to uh bourbon whiskey maturation right. because it because it's using new cask yeah so that's it's legislated um to call bourbon uh bourbon it has to actually be in a brand new uh, yeah, virgin, virgin oak yeah. virgin american oak cask yeah so i think those sorts of numbers, 60% are probably more relevant um, to bourbon. I yep. think when it comes to single malt, um, largely in second fill casks. And by second fill, you mean it's already had a spirit or even a wine in it before they put the the, the new make spirit comes off the still, which is legally then called whiskey after a couple of years in the cask. So, yeah. Correct. So typically with single malt whiskey, they're going into casks that have previously been used. There's a little bit of new oak creeping in uh, for some for some higher end um, whiskies, but but typically it's it goes into an older cask. And so I would say for single malt whiskey, the the, the influence of the oak uh, would be less and and I think it should be I think I think it's important to get the there needs to be balance yes um, single malt whiskey shouldn't be driven by the oak uh, style they should be the oak should be there to complement uh, the characteristics of the of the spirit otherwise it all just becomes about the barrel yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, well, let's keep moving then. So tell us a bit about the journey. Um, and actually, how old were you when you decided to start 2010? Uh, so I was uh, 40, just over 40 at that stage, 41. Yep. Okay, yep. 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 Chicken. yep. And, yeah, I guess I, 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 there was good opportunities in the business that I was working in, but, uh, you know, I was getting – age was part of the consideration. I, I didn't want to be 50, you know, yeah. in my 50s starting a business. So um, I realised um, – you know, even going into the business that it would be a long road and a, and a hard road starting your own business. And I didn't want to be in, you know, later in, in later in years in terms of starting a business and having to yep. be going through that, that process. So. Great. All right. So yeah, it's, um, we know what the, the, the three businesses do. So maybe takes through those years. Mastercast was the first one you started. Yeah, so it started in 2010. Um, yep. So literally, we've just just turned 10 mm -hmm. uh, as a business. Um, and as I said, that originally started purely as a barrel, as a as a business representing uh, two French cooperages that we were uh, involved with out of France, and and an American oak cooperage, and we were purely importing fully fabricated barrels, yep. largely for the wine industry. So no, you weren't doing any coopering, you were just on selling those casks. Correct. And and really just 100% focused on the wine industry yeah. as well. Okay. So the, the obvious challenge there is that the wine industry is a seasonal uh, industry. So it has a vintage where all of the barrels are required over a three to four month period, you know, end of February through to sort of May. Yep. Um, and so it was a very cyclic business and it was cyclic from a cash flow point of view. So that was, yep. that was the first red flag. <laughs> and and yeah. I, cause I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion because 90% of your casks now are for the spirits industry, not wine. So you really, really pivoted away. And secondly, you moved away from just a pure sales model to actually getting into the manufacturing or production of casks. So Correct. I yeah. think that's uh, the last 10 years, I think you, you've, you've got certainly a few more grey hairs I can see right now than <laughs> when I met you five years ago. <laughs> and, a, and a rather uh, elongated forehead. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so it started in 2010 and, I, you know, quickly realised that cash flow-wise it, 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 it needed something else brought into the business. No, in terms of diversifying, what I didn't want to do was to diversify the portfolio of products and take focus away from what is a very technical 
um, sell. Um, yep. When we're when we're our relationships with winemakers and now distillers, it's a very technical one, and it's it it requires a lot of trust, um, and a lot of knowledge of um, the cask itself in terms of how it's sourced, how it's then coopered in the cooperage to optimise the what you are sourcing. And then probably the most important thing I think then is getting the application of the cask correct. Yeah. And so it's a different sort of relationship. It's not just a traditional um, supply relationship. It's very much you're integrated into, uh, into the business because, as you stated, it is such a big part of the finished product. Hmm. So, so... Uh, so that was that's that's typically how we work um, with the winemakers. So in terms of progression, um, I didn't want, as I said, I didn't want to bring too many diversified, different sort of products in. It needed to be focused. So I I heard a little bit about uh, you know the startings of, a, of an industry down in Tasmania around spirit. One of the cooperages that we were representing was the Kelvin Cooperage out of the US, mm-hmm. and they were they're one of the main suppliers to Scotland from a single malt whiskey point of view. So they were very supportive um, and very um, very helpful when it came to um, considering what we needed to look at uh, if we were going to look at uh, single malt whiskey production in Australia from a coopering uh, from a barrel point of view. So 2012 was my first trip down to Tasmania. So the very first person that I ran into down in Tasmania was Patrick McGuire McGuire. from Sullivan's Cave. Oh, right. Hmm. So, and Patrick being the wonderfully accommodating person that he is, um, was happy to spend some, you know, some really good quality value valuable time for me i don't know if it was overly valuable for him but <laughs> <laughs> but he he was also at the time he i think he was the the president of the the local um, distillers association down in tasmania and so he had a list of of the producers which he which he produced which didn't take up um probably 25 percent of an a4 piece of paper yeah. at that stage it would so have been only 10 or 12 distilleries in tasmania back then it was 12 um, and I think at that stage there was only two distilleries that were actively um, producing whiskey on a on a regular on a, on a regular basis. And so, the context is now fifty three in the state of Tasmania, so about a quarter of all distilleries in Australia are in Tasmania. Yeah. So so that was sort of the starting point, and uh, and so he gave me that list. I contacted all of them, and and you know in that first trip tried to get around to see all of them. So that was sort of the starting point. And I think it was later that year we supplied our first barrels uh, into the Tasmanian um, industry. So it was, we started at around, oh, I think in the first year we did 80, 80 90 barrels. And yep. sec- second year we sort of progressed on to sort of five, 600. And then it really stayed at that for a couple of years. And it really wasn't until 2014 um, that we were working with a couple of key distilleries and and what we were getting as indications in terms of the numbers of barrels that they'd be looking for changed changed the business quite a bit and that's where the opportunity to sort of look at getting into our own uh, production and creating our own uh, production capabilities really really started so um, that was sort of mid 2014 and and as quick as uh, the november 2014 when we actually established um the Tasmanian Cast Company on its current site um, in Bridgewater. Yep, right, great. So that's six years ago. And what kind of um, cask numbers are you pumping out now? So I guess there's a stay, there's a step in between that where we also purchased what was uh, SA Cooperage in, in South Australia. Mm-hmm. And I mean, just to give again some context on why two cooperages. Obviously, we felt it was really important to be based in Tasmania to, to service the Tasmanian industry, which at that point was really the hub of Australian yep. single malt uh, production. Um, and then as things progressed, obviously, there were more and more producers starting on the mainland. And whilst we're at a huge advantage in servicing our Tasmanian customers from a Tasmanian distillery, at uh, Cooperage, we were at a big disadvantage in, in servicing the guys out of on the mainland out of there. So... It was really it was really that that drove uh, the need to um, have a cooperage on the mainland, mm-hmm. um, and things being what they were in terms of timing with the with the existing owners of that um, Ray and Roger, um, that 
and we already had a relationship with those guys because we were we were very strong in terms of sourcing fortified barrels out of the wine industry because of our relationships there. Yep. Um, and even though they were technically competitors, um, we were actually supplying them with some with some oak. And yep. because there was that good relationship there already, um, we were sort of a logical go-to when they were looking to to, to sell that business. To yeah, to exit. Yeah. So if SA Cooperage they're based in in Adelaide or just out of Adelaide, and that's where you're based as well, um, Darren. Yeah, and that just just for clarity too, that that has recently changed from we've renamed that Australian Coopers. Um, yep. SA Cooperage meant a lot when it was a, a local cooperage making barrels for the local wine wineries. But um, as as we now selling nationally and more recently even internationally, um, you know that name didn't sort of um, have the same sort of importance. So we've moved that on now to Australian Coopers. Yeah, great. And, and, and to answer your question, then we've we've sort of evolved from you know early days of sort of five to six hundred spirit barrels a year. Um, the last full financial year, so FY nineteen uh, nineteen, yep. yeah. So that sort of progressed to just over ten thousand barrels. Wow, that's phenomenal! That's just awesome. for just for spirit. So yeah, that's yeah. fantastic, and that's both um, Australian Coopers and Tasmanian Cast Company combined. Combined, and also some still some direct imported barrels as well, which are yep. still fully fabricated. So there's still some opportunities. Um, in addition to the growth of the industry, there's still opportunities for us to convert what is cooped overseas still yep. uh, into local production as well. Yeah, great. And on the key numbers, so that, that's a really good number to show the growth. What about the number of team members? Like when you started in 2010, was it just yourself? Can you kind of illustrate how many FTE back then and now, 2020, kind of roughly how many across those three businesses? Yeah, absolutely. I think with any with any business, um, well, it started with myself. Um, yep. So I was I was it, um, and I think like a, a lot of small businesses that start uh, that are privately owned, uh, family played an important role in the early days. So yes. I used to have my mother sitting next to me um, in a little room we used to have out the back of our house, and we'd be working away together. Sort of, she'd be doing a lot of the administrative sort of yep. tasks, and I'd be uh, I'd be doing my you know my diverse range of um, roles that I had within, yeah. <laughs> within a small business. So not, not an unusual story. Um, no. But but that has progressed now through um, to we've got 10 full-time uh, Coopers uh, in Tasmania. Yep. And we've got eight at the moment uh, in South Australia. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we've got some admin staff. We've got uh, in total four full-time admin staff as well. Wow, yep. So, um, and as you said earlier on, uh, cooperage um, work by nature means means people. Yes. So yeah, I mean, there's there's a little bit of automation, as I said, but largely as you're growing from a coopering point of view, it will mean more people, and particularly in our business because we're dealing with secondhand oak. Yep. Um, so if you're fabricating new barrels, you can bring a lot more automation because you're dealing with a consistent product. Yep. Um, we're dealing with all of the variances of. You know, 70 or 80 different coopers around the world that are making barrels um, in the that we're getting as second-hand barrels to to rejuvenate and to recuper those. So yep. it is very much a, uh, a handmade product. Yeah, right. So what's that roll up to then, about 25 to 30 FTE? Correct, yeah. Yep. Great. Yep. That's phenomenal growth. Um, when was the moment you felt like you'd succeeded? I still don't. I looked at, <laughs> where, <laughs> where, Tough one, isn't it? Did, it, it's interesting when you sent that through and I, I looked at that question sort of in, in the lead up to, to having this chat. Um, I still don't, I don't feel like we have. And I say that because it, it's interesting. So there, there's some big international uh, cooperage groups around the world that really do dominate um, the international market. And and we have we have both of those companies with actual cooperages based here in Australia. Yeah. And so when I started this, we, we've become the only Australian owned uh, business with capacity. There's there's a number of other really small cooperages, but in terms of serious capacity and an investment into the industry that has the ability to really be a serious um, uh, long term supplier to the industry, we we're the only Australian owned um, business in that space. And so those two international companies have obviously uh, a long history 
um, huge resources. Yep. Um, and so we're continuing to make sure that we're being innovative. Um, we're very technically driven. We're doing a lot of work in R&D to make sure that we can bring huge amount of value to this industry and make sure that we continue to be a viable part of the industry going forward. Mm -hmm. um, but also to give ourselves a chance to, to also um, start to look at export markets yep. and, and start to be, because that will then really give us the, the growth opportunity to become a serious competitor um, with those two international companies that we have here. I think it's very rare, probably across most industries, that a company is born in Australia and then is able to go and export and take on some big international suppliers. Typically, it works the other way because of just because of the population and, and the size and the size of the markets you yeah. know, around the world. It's typically things are developed, um, and you can get better return on investments and development in bigger countries. Yeah. And then and then those things come to Australia. So that's been my driving sort of um, passion and goal. And that's why I say, uh, in terms of success, I, I'm not there. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that uh, leads on to the next question. What does success look like to you? So it sounds like maybe, you know, t stealing some of that market share from these two other big bigger players. Is that? In internationally. Yeah. And, and what that will do, um, you know, it's important for the growth of the business, but it's important for the security of the business. Yeah. You know, if you're always vulnerable to big international competitors uh, in a small market, which we are, um, then that will always be a challenge. I think the more that we can build our business into being an international business um, gives us a lot more stability in our business from a cash. You know, there's, there's lots of advantages to it, but but what it does, it it just it brings a lot more security to the business um, yep. going forward, and and it continues to enable us to invest more and more uh, in R and D. And and as I said, we we work in a very traditional. Um, Coopering itself is traditional. Yes. Whiskey, produ whiskey production in itself is very traditional as well. It's a 400-year-old industry, whiskey, isn't it? Absolutely. And there's so much opportunity for innovation. I think that's the opportunity for the Australian spirits industry in terms of you know, spirit production yep. and to create our own style. What we want to do as a cooperage is make sure that we're facilitating that. Yes. You know, yep. that we, we're part of that. Um, we're part of that development of our industry that will set the Australian industry apart and make sure that the Australian spirits industry has a long-term place on the international market as well. Yep. Yeah, so great. That's really our driver. Yep. And what about funding the business growth? It, it, kind of what, uh, how did you start out? Was it your own money? Did you have investors, bank finance or government grants over the years, anything, any of those on the 10-year journey? Yeah, it was an interesting time to start your own business, I think. Um, it was post-GFC. Yep. There'd been a lot of uh, regulatory changes in, you know, in the banking sector uh, and obviously a lot of tightening of uh, policy around lending money. So really the banks weren't an option, so it was, it was private money. Yep. Um, uh, I've got a very, very supportive family and particularly a supportive wife. And yep. um, so we, we sold our family home that we owned, um, turned that into, turned that into some cash yep. and, and started the journey. Um, so that was sort of the, the first part of the process. And then I had exceptional support from uh, the Kelvin Cooperage um, based in the U S so to, to the tune that, you know, in the early days, they'd say to me, we'll send you two containers you pay for them when you sold them or when you can afford it. Wow, so that's phenomenal. Yeah, so it was, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's amazing. And, you know, that. what's nice at the moment is as a business now having started exporting is we're exporting back through the Kelvin Cooperage, creating a lot of value in their business um, for them yep. um, because they're connected to the international market and that's, uh, you know, it's a high priority for us at the moment. But yep. Um, so we're now buying from them, but we're also selling back to them as well and, yep. and adding value in their business. So it's nice to be able to do that uh, philosophically. Yeah, mm. exactly. Yeah. 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 And what about any government grants or other private investment down the track come in? Um, certainly bought some other private investor investment in. Um, yep. Chris Malcolm invested into the business um, several years ago. Yep. And um, that's been a really, uh, really important progression in the business on a couple of fronts. One... Um, one, the finance itself, but also some additional um, 
know, professional resources, I suppose, if you like, and yeah. which are also part of the challenge of growing a business. Yeah. Well, Chris um, is very experienced, obviously, with Clark Rubber Franchise. He owns that whole business and has had many decades. I think he's in the Hall of Fame for franchise ores in Australia. Right. We obviously worked together when we were at Lark. He was a, a director on, on my board. Yeah, very good strategic thinker. Yeah, it's been, um, you know, it's been a really good uh, progression um, since Chris sort of joined the business and um, we work well together. He he understands, um, you know, from a technical point of view that, uh, you know, there's a lot of complexities and a lot of experience. And so um, I guess the, our roles within the within the business and how we manage it, I mean, he largely leaves the, you know, the running of the company Um to, to myself so that hasn't changed a lot in that regard and he's really there for support yeah um, which has been great and next question there if you were to start up today with plenty of funding would you go into your industry if not why and what else would you do i still think well there's two i look at that from a, a couple of different points of view one if i had lots you know if there was plenty of funding um, would i go into our industry um, I guess there's a timing element to that, yeah. and I would say certainly if I had lots of funding at the time that I went in uh, mm. into the industry, I definitely I wouldn't change that decision at no. all. Yeah. Um, but I would still say that holds true today. I still think if I'm a, if I'm an oak business and I'm looking at the spirits industry, um, and I had I had available funds, would I invest in it? My answer would be would be yes. Yeah. Um, even though, as I said, if you, if you looked at barriers to entry, you would have us um, yep. as, a, as a locally owned business reasonably well established and two big international players already in this space. Yeah. That, that's probably enough to service uh, the industry. Um, but I still think where I think there's opportunity is still uh, and something we're still very much focused on and can see a long road ahead is still innovation, yep. um, uh, R&D, you know, really optimising barrel maturation. Uh, there's still lots of different styles of whiskey that, and you know, we're also now going into rum. You know, I think there's a lot of interest in rum yep. uh, around the world, but also in Australia. There's a number of projects that we're we're sort of working with, which are still have some time to run before they start. But you know, there, you can see that going forward, there'll be a lot of activity in the rum space. Um, you know, tequila as well. Um, yeah. To a, to a lesser extent. Yep. Uh, and one thing I'm really passionate about, it won't ever be a huge um, part of the industry, but I'm really passionate about getting um, barrel mature gin yep. right. <laughs> right. Yeah, there are a few distilleries <laughs> doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's, a, you know, that's a very, I guess you'd liken it to Sauvignon Blanc in wine as well. You know, mm-hmm. very aromatic, very sort of, uh, very vibrant, um, uh, driven sort of drinks that are very um, delicate. So to bring any sort of other maturation product to it, it needs to be very refined and very balanced. And they're the, they're the challenges that I love. Yeah. Know, and there's got to be more of that, like di- uh, differentiation, 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 the old marketing term. You've got to have a product out there that's different, particularly in Australia when you talk about gins, for example. There's like 300 different gins in Australia. So that's where the innovation is really going to come into the fore um, as well as I think the exciting time. As David Vitale said, I interviewed him a few weeks ago, a good friend of mine and a mentor of mine, as we both know from Starwood, mm-hmm. now living in Seattle. But he's of the opinion that the Australian spirits scene is still has still got some growth to go in it um, from a you know demand point of view for craft spirits. So I think that's I, very exciting. Yeah, growth for growth for demand, but also growth in terms of defining styles. Yes. Mm. Yeah, I mean we're a ve- we're hugely diverse country in terms of um, you know if you look from Tasmania up to you know you know central coast of New South Wales up to Queensland. Well, the first know, distillery in Northern Territory opened in March. The first you know, so, distillery, yeah. So they're all they're all great. Uh, you know, if, if you look at maturation, the barrels one aspect of it. You've also got the conditions in which the barrels are being um, yes. stored and how they're being stored, that plays a huge role. So, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, understanding uh, the diversity, the diversity of the new make as well in Australia that we see is is huge as well. So there's there's good definition in the, in the spirits themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of diversity in maturation conditions. 
uh, as a cooperage, that just creates a significant amount of opportunity for us to work with yes. distillers yep. to, to, to provide just the right application of oak yep. in the maturation process to, to, really, to really make sure that we enhance that and we, we see that in the finished product. As I said, not that it's all just oak driven. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Let's talk about what's the most stressful point in the, your small business growth journey so far so our audience can learn from that. Well, again, I'm not going to be um, Robinson Crusoe here. Um, so, <laughs> I, mean, I think it's usually one of one or two things, one or one or two things: cash or people. Well, well and it's and it's both of those two. It's <laughs> both of those for us, but maybe a slightly different story on on the. And there's an interesting aspect to the to the um, to the people side of it. But yeah, cash flow, particularly in our industry, investment in oak. Um, you, you really, you know, in the early days we very quickly were had in excess of 3,000 barrels that we were carrying as, as stock barrels. Yeah, could, to give, con- again, some a background on that, because you have to sometimes season those casks, so you break them down, you throw them outside for, for potentially years at a time for them to be, you know, aired, not aired out or seasoned is, is the industry term, I guess. So that's a mm. lot of capital sitting there. Yeah, so we we have started a program of seasoning our own oak. Now that is, that's new oak. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but even if you look at even if you look at fortified uh, purchasing a fortified oak, typically wineries will release they'll do all their fortified work in two months of the year, yep. and so all the barrels that will be available ex fortifieds are all available over those, that two month period. So That's you're buying month. those then for the rest of the year. So yes. So and also the other thing you're looking at is fortified is a is it a is it a defined um, there's a defined availability of barrels available yep. uh, for us to purchase so when they're available you want to purchase them so so that creates some cash flow challenges yep. as you said seasoning of oak so that's new oak we, we're seasoning new oak in Tasmania the conditions um, we've selected a site are ideal for seasoning of oak but that that's a three-year yes seasoning program so we're, we're buying American and French oak as what we would call green oak Mm-hmm. Um, we're importing that, and then we're we're stacking that out uh, at a specific location in a specific style of um, stacking the oak to get a certain result from the seasoning. But that's a three year process, so you can imagine you can imagine particularly if you're looking at growing from 500 barrels in year one, and you're forecasting you can do a thousand barrels in year two and 1500 in year three. Mm. You've already got yeah. you know 3,000 barrels worth of oak. Yeah, sitting in a paddock. Sitting, sitting there in a paddock. So, yeah. so, so those sorts of things are quite challenging. From a, from a people point of view, uh, the challenge was that we were starting, it's a very skilled process. Mm. Coopering, a, coopering a barrel is, is, is a very skilled process. You know, you're doing a four-year apprenticeship yep. um, if, you, if you're in France, uh, you know, to become a cooper. Um, and even then... Uh, your on the job training will, will go on forever. I mean, you never stop learning. Yep. And so, for us to start a cooperage in Tasmania, um, uh, I was very fortunate to meet Adam Bone. Mm-hmm. Bone. Uh, yeah. uh, so he had he had some experience in in making barrels, uh, and we joined together in the early days. And that's that's really that gave me the capability um, uh, to for us to even put the cooperage together in the first place down in yep. Tasmania. But, but then the challenge immediately was if we're going to grow this business and as we have now today, we've got nearly um, just over 20 coopers. Yep. Um, there's no school for that. There's no trade for no. that. Um, so you've really got to, yeah, the challenge was really to build that skill set. Yep. Um, in Australia that didn't didn't exist. It, it used to exist. We used to have, you know, even in Adelaide, we used to have 30 coopers in right. the city of Adelaide right. making barrels for beer, Yeah, you know, to ship beer around in. So, <laughs> um, And that wasn't so long ago, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and uh, so obviously once the keg came along, that yep. sort of that killed that industry. But um, so we're really reviving it. The spirits industry has been really the key to reviving um, the trade of coopering, coopering barrels, and as I said before, there's lots of you know other small coopers that are working in a, in a very small way in the industry as well, which is great yep. to see. Yeah. And what areas in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? For us, for for me, the key thing is to get more value, and I keep 
again, it, I think it's 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 communicating with your staff is really the key the key thing. As you grow, keeping connected to your staff is a real challenge. Yep. Um, in the early days, I had sort of one on rate one on one relationships with most of the coopers that we had in the Tasmanian business. These days, I'm reliant on on Scott for that communication, and so what I think we did a really good job of in the early days was the, the people that were working for us weren't just coming to work to do a job. They believed in the vision yeah. uh, and the opportunity that we were involved in something that was really special yeah. and that and that they could come to work and, and get more out of their day than just, you know, just, than just a paycheck. So, yeah. um, and that was something every time I'd go down there, we made sure that we kept, um, communicating as to where we were at, how we were going, what were the exciting things that were happening in the business and what that meant for them. Yep. And so as we, as I'm now reliant on staff to deliver those messages, making sure that the same passion, yes. the, same, the same essence, the same story, um, uh, you know, the opportunities that are there in the business that they still feel, they still feel that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, is, that is challenging with growth, yeah, particularly. And what have you enjoyed the least about managing fast growth? The least, well, obviously the cash. You know, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> yep. you know, sleepless nights sort of worrying about, you know, how all this is going to get funded and, and those sorts of challenges have been. Look, I think in an, in an ideal world, if you could if you could write your business plan at the start, understand where you're going to be in five years and know that you've got the cash Put aside to to deliver on that and just go and just go and execute on that. I think that would be fantastic. <laughs> I think that's I think that's rarely the case. Yes, yeah, not often yeah. reality. Yeah. yeah. What's been the biggest mindset shift for you in, in your journey so far, small business journey? Well, obviously, and, and again, I'm, I'm not going to be um, uh, you know revolutionary here, but it's it's trying to take what you can control as one person. Mm. And make sure that as the business grows, that all of that still stays intact, um, and and to be able to you know hand those things on uh, to to staff and let them run with it and and you know let them get on with with doing it and not try and control every aspect of everything every minute of the day. Yep, that, that's been the biggest biggest challenge uh, for me for sure. Yeah, and what what is the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? I think every business owner um, and entrepreneur, mm-hmm. you really need to understand the numbers. Yep. You no, have no. To, you have to understand the numbers. Yep. And and you have to understand that going into it, you are going to be you are going to get to points throughout the process that are going to absolutely bring you to your core and you're going to need to have a good hard look in the mirror. Yep. <laughs> um, and and you need to you need to also not be too not be too hard on yourself either. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you, you need to you need to try and take um, a breath occasionally. Yep. Look look back at where you come from and acknowledge that you are moving things forward. Yeah. It, it never seems like you're moving it forward quick enough. Yes. Um, That's in our DNA, I think. It is. It is. So you know, they, they would be the things that, um, that, that I'd say. Yep. Find it hard to define a clear strategy, then communicate it and execute it alongside the rest of your team? Or you currently don't work a simple quarterly strategic plan to boost your team's performance? Our Business Growth Formula online course is perfect for small business owners with five to 30 team members wanting to grow. We share the mindsets, habits and tools to be a legendary leader in your business. GrowSmallBusiness.com. Let's talk about people. How have you added people to the team? Some wins, mistakes, and advice for those listening. Well, and again, and again here, I think it, it, quite often in the early days when I'd put on a person and, and it didn't necessarily work out, I took that all. I took that to heart too. Yep. Um, as it, you know, I employed the wrong person and that was a fail. Um, yep. So I think you just need to realise uh, that it's okay. It's okay for someone not to, not to fit. You know, for whatever reason it is, mm-hmm. and I think I think it it also some, one of the things that I've realised is as long as you're communicating that to uh, you're communicating with your staff, those those difficult decisions shouldn't be surprises. Yeah. Um, and well, they'll know if they're a bad egg if they're not working out. The, the rest of the team will see that. 
Mm. Yeah, and provided you've had those conversations along the way, um, yep. you know, we've got a solid team now, but yep. it's been it's been it's evolved. Yeah, it's not it's not been a, a defined process. Mm. And again, coopering is it takes a special person to want to work in a cooperage. It's it's you know it's it's noisy, it's physical, um, it's, it's hard work, but hot in and obviously hot in summer. Yeah. Um, so, for someone to want to to continue to be motivated to do that sort of work is is quite difficult. So, we've had a, you know, typically, we've now got. It's easier once you've got the core of yep. your team in place, mm. and then that way, when you go and employ another person, if it doesn't work out, well, that, you know, it's not a, it's not a biggest impact on the business. Yeah. But in the early days, it was. It was a real challenge. Yeah. Um. So I think. I think I think to to get overly bogged down in interview processes and things like that are uh, I think at the end of the day you can only you can only glean so much and I know that there's techniques around interviewing um, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day I still think it's uh, you know it's a process where it's either going to work or it's not and you're not really going to know that until you get into it. No, so, you've got to see them in action and use your probation period for sure. Yeah, so you know get get into it, make sure that you're continually updating people as to what's working and not what yep. what's not working make sure the communication is really good and like i said if things aren't working out they'll know that anyway yeah yep. and then that makes that whole process easier and what are some things you'd recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth particularly because you've got those two sites south australia and tasmania as well any advice around culture i think the key thing um, with culture is absolutely making sure that everyone feels like they can contribute um, yep. and that they should never feel um, uh, afraid or fearful of 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 raising issues yeah pointed pointing out shortcomings even of, of myself yep um, I think that's absolutely if you can create that sort of environment where everyone feels comfortable to really um, raise their hand and raise concerns and I think they feel they're very invested in the business they be, they, they feel like it's their own mm. to a degree and as I said the other thing, is to make sure that they understand what the objectives of the business. They're not there just to come and punch out X amount of barrels per day. Yep. Um, yeah. Making, making sure you got the, you, know, you need to be performing. You need to be hitting targets. You need to be. You need to be managing that. You know, very. Yep. Very firmly. Um, I think that's really important. What you just said a minute ago regarding talk, people feeling comfortable to talk about fuck-ups, not just the ones they've made, but their line manager upstream. If you've got a really good culture where someone is comfortable to, you know, the business just gets better and better rather than people hiding mistakes under the carpet, et cetera. I work with a business at the moment that has the opposite culture where it's driven by fear, sorry, managed by fear. And so people just won't put their hand up when they see something really wrong in the business or they've made a mistake. You know, it's it's just terrible. I think it even. I think it can even be worse than that. I think it can actually, um, you know, it, it, managing by fear means that they, those people they're fearful of doing. You know, if they've got a brief, they'll stick to the brief. Yeah. You know, and they'll deliver on that for for the person that's in, that's instilling the fear to make sure that mm. they're happy with the outcome. What I see in that sort of culture, nine times out of ten, is that the end result is is a fraction of what it could have been. Yeah, there's no innovation, there's no passion, no one's going the extra mile. The way I like to, when I bring new people into the business, what I look for are people for the role that I'm bringing them in for, that they're better at that than what I am. Yes, that's great. And, and so that, um, so that I know that they can, I can give them a brief of what I think we need to do. Yep. And and A, they can have some input into that. So but once we've decided what we're what we're looking to do, is that when they go away and do that and they bring it back to me, it's evolved. Yeah. It it looks different. It's it's better than it's better than what we discussed and what we'd hoped for going into it. Yep. Because they've felt um they felt able to take risks, to look at other solutions, yep. to challenge to challenge what I've put forward. And to bring something, and when when you see that come back, and it's it's a better outcome, you just go, hey, great, yeah. you know, let's, let's yeah. move on. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Well, how much professional development have you invested in yourself over the years? Books, courses, training, conferences, events, stuff like that. 
Not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got it's a very really... technical background in the wine industry, though. So, I mean, there was a lot of learning and development there, I guess. There was, and uh, yeah, very much a, a street produced product, yeah. really, I suppose, would be the best way to describe myself. And um, I'm not I'm not great at um, being taught things. I like to learn them myself. Now that's that's probably not something that you would um, you would use as an example <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. of a manager of a business, but that's how I'm built. So that's the way yeah. I work. But um, but at the same time, I did have a very technical background, and so I do take a very structured approach to a Got lot it. of things. And I think it's a very practical. Yep. approach and I think what that means is that the people that I'm working with the people that are working in my business can see that yep and so it's very logical it, it makes sense um, it makes sense to them and as I said I make sure that they have the freedom and the confidence to take something and bring it back and make it look different yep, yep. yeah great and what about mentors or coaches over the last 10 years have you had any either formally or informally I've had some informal ones and you were one of them. <laughs> quite, a few, <laughs> quite a few beers at the Winston over the years, haven't we? <laughs> well, I can I can distinctly remember a, a night I think that we had up at um, Ratho. With, Greg, with Greg Ramsey with Ratho, exactly, yep. where, where you and I probably followed up some from some of the early conversations that we'd had and um, really thrashed out um, some of the more specific details of, of of what you saw from the outside as a, as a client at the time of our business and some of the challenges. Yep. Um, and so, you know, those sorts of opportunities. Uh, if that know, was I, late, at, I think that was late at night. So I probably had quite a few sherbet. So I'm even more direct once I've had a few drinks. So I apologize for that. <laughs> I, you know, they're the, they're the things that you, you take on and you know, you're always listening. You always want, yeah. You know, when I say that I haven't uh, done a lot of formal uh, education and, and um, courses, etc. cetera, uh, reading uh, around uh, business management. Um, I, I'm, I'm always looking to, I'm always striving to, to be, to be better. Yep. Um, and, you know, I think people that start businesses that are entrepreneurs are always pretty hard on themselves. So Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I was very hard on myself early on in my career as well. The last few years really focused on uh, dismantling that, I guess. And I speak with a lot of other business owners about that, that as well, which comes up in the cast a lot. And I think interestingly, you, you can afford to do that too, as your business does yeah. evolve. I mean, yeah. it's, it's part of the evolution of the business as well, that you have good people around you. And so you can, you can take, you can start to take a bit of a different view um, uh, of those sorts of, you know, those sorts of issues, I suppose. Yeah. When you look at yourself. Um, well, but just before we get into the final five questions, so uh, a bit over ten years. You started early forties. You and Vicky, did you you sold the house? And what rented? Yeah. Or, wow. Yeah. So you yeah. put everything on black. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you've got uh, two daughters, 19 and 14 now? Correct. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and a very noisy dog there in the background. Correct. <laughs> My dog's snoring on the couch. But, uh, yeah, that's a, a wonderful journey, Darren. And it's been great, obviously, knowing you over the last five years for half of that journey. But I was really keen today to hear more detail about it. Obviously, we've talked in the pub a few times. But that's very exciting. Ten years, three businesses. Uh, in the one industry, yeah, yeah, it, it's been a. It's hard to believe it is ten years. It goes, <laughs> it goes extremely quickly. Um, I think there's something about our industry, though, that because uh, Bill Lark's obviously got a white beard. I my beard's now white. Uh, you've got a bit of um, salt and pepper there as well. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it does ages. Yeah. Oh no, absolutely. And I think I think the other thing, you know, we we are ten years into it, but um, really the investment and the commitment uh, from myself and my family, you know, from that original decision to, to sell a home and to, to invest it all into a business, um, you know, and, and rent out. I mean, we're still renting today. Yep. And we're still renting because we're just, we're just continuing to look at the opportunities in the business and continuing to, uh, to invest that back into, to continuing to grow the business. So, yep. yeah. Um, so, yeah. Great. Well, let's get into the final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? Uh, definitely cash flow and people. Again, it's not going to be too too yep. revolutionary there. So, um, no, definitely, definitely the two hardest things. And favourite business book, which has helped you the most? 
I don't. I haven't read a lot of books actually. I, I probably these days turn to YouTube. Yep. Um, quite a bit. Um, so Simon uh, Sinek. Yes. Why? Um, start with why. Yep. You start with why. Those sorts of things. They, they've been very inspirational along the way. So I, I do. When I say I don't do a lot of formal education, I do a lot um, at looking at entrepreneurs and their stories and what the challenges are, and I take a lot of comfort in that because a lot of a lot of the things that I thought um, were specific and unique to me were they're not. I mean, they're the same struggles as every yep. entrepreneur. So. Yep. Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? Uh, well, online, as I said, more more from a more from a YouTube internet yep. sort of basis, um, yep. more than anything. And one tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? A good accountant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, don't start me on that one. I was having a rant about one of the accountants in one of the six companies I work with at the moment that I am pulling what hair I have left out. <clears throat> yeah, it's so so important to get good advisors, particularly an accountant because it's tax. And, yeah, that's a great one. That is a great one. Well, and I think the way I look at it is a good accountant can be far more than an accountant. You know, yes. To me, I guess the definition of an accountant is, is typically to report on the result. Yeah. Um, I think where I've seen a huge benefit in a, in a great accountant is where they can actually be part of the decision-making yep. um, by by providing exceptional information and data yeah. uh, and give you some trends and some guidelines as to if we move this, this is going to be the outcome. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, information uh, in a business is definitely power. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And my favourite one, what would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? I tell myself on, on day one of starting out is certainly not to be, in retrospect, not to be as hard on yourself. Yep. Take a bit more time to 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 celebrate uh, the wins yes. um, uh, along the way and, and to do that with, with the people around you, family, of course. Um, yep. Um, but but the other thing is to if you when you're starting out, I think you really need to tell yourself and 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 really understand that it is the bigger the opportunity, the actual the harder the road will be. Yeah. So so the bigger the opportunity, the bigger the potential, um, the more groundbreaking, the more unique. Um, we're working on a lot of projects at the moment, which are which are quite innovative around maturation. Um, the biggest challenge with those is is taking them to market and getting the market to getting them educated to understand that this is a change. It's and it's not a risk that it, that it comes with huge benefits for them. So the educational sort of process, um, like I said, the the bigger the the bigger the challenge, the bigger the ambition the absolute harder it'll be and the closer you'll you'll get to I think a point at some point along the along the journey where you will have to really bring that into question yeah uh, uh, and you won't be able to avoid it yes yeah yeah well thanks for your time today Darren it's been great I think the audience will get a shit ton of value out of what you shared with us the journey's been very fast uh, one FTE to around 30 in 10 years three separate businesses i think it's yeah phenomenal what you've what you've achieved with the team and also with chris coming on board in recent years as well thanks troy i really appreciate the chat as always and um we got to grab a beer soon either in adelaide or hobart we can well let's hope yeah (laughs) let's hope so awesome thanks mate Thanks again cheers That's it. Thanks for listening. Please leave a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. It means more small business owners will find our cast and help people with their business growth journey.